Chapter 10. We made a quick stop at the library to make a photocopy of the note. Arthur folded it and dropped it into his pocket. It's always good to have a backup, he said, especially when the original is all you've got. Walmart wasn't as far as the Magic Forest, but there were plenty of big hills to climb between home and the store. As usual, Arthur was way ahead, standing up to pump his skinny legs bulging with muscles the size of tennis balls. No matter what gear I used, and believe me, I tried them all. I couldn't keep up with him. Maybe he was training for that big French bike race. When we finally pulled up at Walmart's sliding doors, I chained my bike to a rack, and Arthur dumped his classic Raleigh on the sidewalk. Inside, the cold air smelled of popcorn, hot dogs, and unidentifiable synthetic substances. A cheap smell, Mom called it. But no matter how the store smelled, it was better than the heat outside. We cruised up and down aisles looking for Violet and checking out the CDs, DVDs, and videos. In the electronics department, Arthur lingered over a stereo system with flashing LEDs small enough to fit in a bookcase, but loud enough to entertain the whole neighborhood. He fiddled with the bass and the treble, turned the volume up and down, and investigated the five CD tray until I lost patience and dragged him away. We're looking for Violet, I reminded him. Arthur scanned the store and pointed. There she is, in office supplies. She's the one talking to a customer. He started toward a clerk wearing the standard blue Walmart vest over a yellow t-shirt and a pair of jeans. She didn't anywhere near resemble my image of the sort of person who'd marry someone like Silas. Too pretty for one thing, and too fragile. She was so little and skinny, a gust of wind could probably strand her in a treetop. Nor did she look mean enough or old enough to be Danny's mother. She must have been 13 or something when he was born. When Arthur was about 15 feet from Violet, he stopped so suddenly, his running shoes squeaked on the vinyl floor. Without a word of explanation, he dropped to his knees behind a display of school binders and pulled me down beside him. That man, he pointed, the one she's talking to, it's not a customer, it's Silas. I crouched beside Arthur and stared at the man. He was tall and lean, but his biceps bulged like he'd spent his whole life pressing iron. He was a lot older than Violet and a lot bigger. With her arms folded across her chest, Violet seemed to shrink into herself. She looked at the floor, not at Silas, her body tense. I had a feeling she was praying for a customer to come along and rescue her. I thought Silas was in jail, I whispered. Me too. Even though we couldn't hear what Silas was saying, he sounded mad. He kept jabbing his finger at Violet. She blinked every time he did it and stepped back. He moved forward when she moved back. Soon he had her up against shelves stocked with felt-tipped pens, crayons, pencils, and ballpoints. Trapped, no place to retreat. They're my kids too, he said in a voice loud enough to startle a little girl who had just wandered over. Her mother shot Silas a worried look and hurried down the next aisle. For all she or anyone knew, Silas was about to pull out a gun and start firing. He was definitely the type to show up on the evening news, holding a dozen cops at bay while threatening to kill the Walmart shoppers he'd taken hostage. Instead of heading for the door like sensible people, Arthur and I sneaked closer to hear what Silas was going on about. Violet cowered against the pens and said something in a low voice. I don't care what your lawyer thinks, Silas suddenly yelled, throwing in a few cuss words to describe the man. They're my kids. I'll see them if I want to. With that, he turned around and headed for the door. Making sure Violet wasn't looking, Arthur followed him, and I followed Arthur. We watched Silas cross the parking lot and straddle a motorcycle. 
He gunned the engine and left with a roar loud enough to shatter glass. In a few seconds, he had disappeared into the traffic on Route 23. Now that it was safe, Arthur and I hurried back to office supplies. Violet was tidying up the pens. She looked as if she might have been crying. Hey, Violet, Arthur walked up to her, grinning as if he'd just noticed her. I haven't seen you for ages. She turned and looked at him, her face blank. I beg your pardon? Keeping up the cheerful act, he smiled broadly. Don't you remember me? She studied his face for a moment. Oh my goodness, Arthur Jenkins, of course I remember you. How's your grandmother these days? She's fine, same as ever. Well, tell her hello for me. I will. Arthur turned to me. This is Logan Forbes. He lives in your mother's old house. I heard someone bought it. Violet looked at me curiously, but I turned my attention to a display of notebooks. I wanted to tell her I was sorry about her mother being murdered, but I couldn't think of a good way to say something like that. Logan's dad is doing a lot of work, Arthur said. The house is starting to look pretty good. Is Bear still hanging around, Violet asked. Grandma and I took him in, Arthur said, but he's at Logan's house most of the time. Danny wanted to keep Bear, Violet said, but Silas said no, he hated that dog. Speaking of Silas, Arthur said, soul of tact that he was, I saw him leaving the store when we were coming in. When did he get out of jail? Violet busied herself with a display of ball points and snazzy colors. Last week, she said, moving on to a row of spiral bound notebooks. He's on probation. I don't know what they were thinking of letting him out. He'll just get himself in trouble again. How much is this? A woman in a flowered blouse and tight pink pants came up to Violet holding a purple plastic file box. I don't know why you people can't put prices on things. As Violet took the box from the woman, Arthur said, can I ask you something important? Really important? I added, finally getting the nerve to say something. Violet looked puzzled. Like what? Do I have to get a manager for a price check? The woman butted in, scowling at me, she added. My time is very important. So is mine, Arthur said. I'm sorry, ma'am. Violet led the woman away, but she called back to us. Wait there. I'll only be a minute. True to her word, Violet came back fast. Returning the purple file box to the shelf, she said. She thought it was way too expensive and a piece of junk. Arthur handed her the little magic forest bag. We found this in the attic. There's a note inside from your mother. Violet gasped. From my mother? She pulled out the plastic gingerbread men. Oh my gosh, I used to play with these when I was little. Her eyes filled with tears and she brushed them away with one hand. The note, Arthur said, read the note. Violet smoothed the creases out of the paper. It's mom's handwriting, she whispered. More tears ran down her face. This time she ignored them. When she'd read the note, she looked at Arthur I knew my mother didn't steal that money, but she knew who did steal it, Arthur pointed out. It couldn't have been the park's owner, Mr. Farrell, was a nice old man, Violet said. When I was little, he let me ride the rides for free and gave me candy, little peppermints. Who else worked there? I don't remember anybody but Mr. Farrell, Violet frowned. No, wait, there was somebody else. He was hired long after I got too old for the magic forest. Mom complained about him all the time, but I don't remember his name. I'm sorry. What was the finding game? Arthur asked. What does it have to do with the briefcase? I don't know. Violet shook her head sadly. I haven't thought about the magic forest for years. It makes me too sad. Mom's dead, the park's closed, it's like my whole childhood is gone. It was time to call it quits, I thought, at least for now. Violet had had enough of us. But when I looked at Arthur, I could see he still had questions. I don't think he'd even notice Violet was close to crying. How about you know who, he persisted. Were you scared of some woman who worked in the park, 
somebody who knew the embezzler? I was afraid of a lot of things when I was little. She paused. I still am, she added in a low voice, more to herself than us. Think, Violet, think, Arthur begged. It has to be a woman. The note says she's just, just what? Violet wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. There was a mean old lady who worked at the frozen custard stand, she said slowly. I was afraid to ask for a cone when she was working, but I don't see what she'd have to do with anything. Before Arthur could ask another question, a sharp-faced little man interrupted us. Too much talking, Miss Phelps. Shooting a nasty look at Arthur and me, he added, you boys need to buy something or leave. Yes, sir, Mr. Phillips, Violet said. They wanted some advice about school supplies, and I, no excuses. I saw you wasting time earlier talking to a man. If it happens again, I'll put a comment in your file. We watched him stalk off toward electronics, his baggy pant legs flapping around his ankles. Violet scowled at the man's back. He thinks being a manager at Walmart is a really big deal. Sorry, I said. We didn't mean to get you in trouble. It's okay. He's always mad at somebody. We'd better go. Arthur held out his hand for the bag. Please let me keep it, Violet said. My mother wrote the note to me. And the little men I thought were gone forever. She gazed at us with those big, sad eyes of hers. Arthur and I looked at each other. I was kind of reluctant to let our only evidence go, but how could we say no? After all, we did have a copy of the note. Don't let anybody see it, Arthur said. Violet pressed the bag to her heart. It's my secret, she said, mom's and mine. And try to figure out what your mom meant about the finding game, Arthur said, and not being scared. Violet nodded, her face solemn with worry. I will. Outside, Arthur and I got on our bikes and pedaled across the parking lot. After Walmart's super-duper air-conditioned comfort, it was like riding into a wall of fire. Ahead of us, the asphalt shimmered in the heat. We stopped at the edge of the road and waited for a break in the traffic. Where to now, I asked. Want to see the Phelps place, Arthur asked. It's definitely not to be missed. You can see the Jarman's house, too. Two for the price of one. A real treat. Without another word, he sped away, leaving me no choice except to follow in his wake. Chapter 11 After a half hour of steady uphill climbing, made even more fun by cars and trucks racing past just inches from my handlebars, Arthur turned off the highway. Soon, we were making our way up an even steeper hill on a narrow dirt road that wound along the edge of a sharp drop-off. Not the sort of place to encounter a large vehicle. Nowhere to go but off the road and down the hill into a rock-strewn gully. Certain death. Finally, Arthur rounded a curve and came to a stop, skidding on loose gravel and dirt. The Phelps' house is up the hill on the left. The mobile home where Violet lives is behind it. He wiped his sweaty face with his arm. The Jarmans live on the other side of the road. They've got a bunch of mean dogs who hate bikes. While I tried to convince myself I wasn't scared of the Jarmans or their dogs, Arthur dumped his old Raleigh in a thicket of honeysuckle and wild grapevine. Sure, I was making a big mistake. I laid my bike beside his. Keeping a screen of underbrush between ourselves and the road, we sneaked toward the houses. I had a feeling those dogs could smell us ten miles away, even if something like the old Berlin Wall separated us from them. Voila la maison Phelps, Arthur pointed to an old farmhouse weathered to gray. Its roof was patched with sheets of plywood, and a pile of cinder blocks propped up one corner of the front porch. A vine, no doubt kudzu, covered most of the porch roof and hung from the eaves. Except for the satellite dish attached to a tree, some people might have described the place as picturesque in a ramshackle run-down way, but not if they'd known anything about the inhabitants. Its chrome shining, Silas's motorcycle leaned against the porch. My stomach plummeted. 
He must be home. That was bad, very bad. Behind the house was a beaten up old mobile home. From somewhere inside, a radio blasted 70s hard rock music, but no one was in sight. Look over there, Arthur pointed across the road. La Maison German. The German's house was smaller and made of stone, but it was as neglected. Two small cement lions sat on the porch, gazing across the overgrown lawn. At least a dozen skinny cats slept on the sagging roof of a rusted out geo prism, but the dogs were nowhere to be seen. Crudely lettered signs nailed to trees warned strangers away. Beware, vicious attack dogs, one said. No trespassing, said another. And the scariest of all, half gun will shoot. The hot summer sun beat down on my bike helmet. Sweat ran down my spine. My t-shirt stuck to my skin. I felt dizzy from the heat and the endless buzzing of cicadas. I wanted to go home before the dogs attacked or a Jarman came to the door and shot us with his half gun. But before I had a chance to say, let's go, I saw Silas step out of the mobile home. Danny was right behind him. From our hiding place, we watched Silas straddle his motorcycle. Give me a ride, Dad, Danny begged. You promised. His voice had a nasal edge, almost a whine, that I hadn't noticed when I met him at the toot and toot. Some other time, maybe tomorrow. You said that yesterday, Danny said, definitely whining. And the day before, his dad shrugged, strapped on his helmet and roared down the driveway with the throttle wide open. Danny watched him leave, his face creased with disappointment. When Silas was out of sight, but not out of hearing, Danny stood in the driveway, his head down, his shoulders drooping, kicking stones. I could almost have felt sorry for him. Almost, not quite. A skinny little girl appeared in the mobile home's doorway, maybe five, maybe six. She wore a faded t-shirt and baggy shorts, and her hair was the color and texture of dental floss. Is daddy gone? What do you think? Danny muttered a few cuss words and went into the mobile home with the girl. The screen door slammed behind them like a gunshot. That was May, Arthur whispered, Danny's little sister. Poor kid. Just as I was about to suggest leaving, Billy's pickup rumbled into sight. Johnny was with him. In the back were the boxes from the attic bulging with Mrs. Donaldson's stuff. Ducking behind a tree, we watched Billy pull into the driveway. He and Johnny got out and began unloading the boxes. Dumping the contents on the ground, they started pawing through the clothing, books, and newspapers. You really think you're going to find any money? Johnny asked. She had it hid all over the house. Ask anybody. That's just a rumor, Billy. I was in and out of there a lot, doing yard work and stuff. I kept my eyes peeled, I can tell you, but I never saw an extra dollar bill. She could barely afford to pay me for cutting the grass. Then why did somebody kill her? Johnny shrugged. Money was probably what he was after, but I doubt he got any. Maybe she hid it in the magic forest. Billy kicked a thick book across the yard. Did you ever think of that? Johnny grimaced and wiped his sweaty face with his t-shirt. If she hid it in that jungle, nobody will ever find it. A couple of million bucks is worth looking for, ain't it? Johnny shrugged. That's just a rumor. Nobody knows for sure how much was missing. Danny chose that moment to cross the road. What are you guys doing with that old stuff? Nothing. Billy kicked a box over and scowled at the books and records and photo albums that tumbled out. Just junk. Signaling to Johnny, he headed for the pickup. Can I come with you? Danny asked. Neither Billy nor Johnny answered. Leaving Mrs. Donaldson's stuff in the yard, they got into the truck and drove away. Left behind again, Danny cussed all the swear words I'd ever heard and a few I hadn't. Then he pulled a low-slung bike out of the weeds and rode off, still cussing. I pitied anyone smaller than him who looked at him the wrong way. Come on, I said, let's get out of here before someone else comes along. Just as we reached the place where we'd hidden our bikes, the dogs crawled out from under the geo. Three of them, 
long and lean and mean, part wolf from the look of them, maybe all wolf, barking like hellhounds they came after us fast. Arthur and I threw ourselves on our bikes and started pedaling faster than I thought was possible. The dogs were right behind us, so close I swear I could feel their hot breath on my bare legs. Just as I thought they had us, we crested the hill and started down. Bumping over ruts and skidding on loose gravel, we stayed on our bikes as if we were glued to the seats. From the bottom of the hill, we could hear the dogs barking, but they seemed to have lost interest in chasing us. Maybe they just wanted to scare us away. Well, I can tell you, they succeeded. My heart was beating so hard, I was afraid it would burst. Those dogs were bigger than the hounds of Baskervilles and twice as vicious. I frowned at Arthur. I'm never coming near this place again. He pushed his sweaty hair back from his forehead leaving it standing straight up. As James Bond once said, never say never. Never, 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 I retorted. When we finally got home, my legs ached. In fact, I almost fell down when I got off my bike. I was that sore. But before I had a chance to go inside and take a nap in the bathtub, Mrs. Jenkins beckoned to us from her back door. Somebody's here to see you boys, she called. Violet was sitting at the kitchen table, looking as weary as I felt. The plastic gingerbread men were scattered across the table. Arthur grabbed a couple of cold cans of soda from the refrigerator and handed me one. I don't know whether to drink it, he said, or to pour it over my head. I say drink it. I flopped down at the table, tipped the can back, and gulped it down so fast I almost choked. Violet showed me the note from her mother, Mrs. Jenkins said. We've been sitting here trying to figure out what game she meant. Across the table from me, Violet toyed with the green gingerbread men. Remember the map of the magic forest they used to give you when you bought a ticket, she asked Arthur. He nodded. There were little pictures of all the attractions, Willie, the castle. If I looked at one, Violet said, maybe I'd remember the finding game. I bet the library has plenty of them in the local history file, Arthur said. Want me to get one for you? I'd go myself, Violet said, but I work the nine to six shift tomorrow, the same hours the library's open. She pushed her chair back and gathered up her things. I have to go home and fix dinner for the kids. At the door, Mrs. Jenkins gave her a hug. You be careful, honey. Being divorced isn't enough to keep Silas away. Any trouble, you call me. Come over if you like. Bring the kids. We've got an extra bedroom. Arthur raised his eyebrows in mock horror and ran a finger across his throat. Neither one of us wanted Danny Phelps staying at Arthur's house. The next morning, Arthur and I rode our bikes to the library. He headed straight to a row of gray filing cabinets against the rear wall. Dropping to his knees, he opened a bottom drawer labeled Local History. Flipping through the folders, he pulled one out and waved it at me. Voila, he cried, the magic forest. We sprawled on the floor and started going through the folder. Stuck in with old photographs and newspaper clippings was a map of the magic forest, showing a wide path looping around Willie the Whale's pond. Smaller paths branched off, leading to kiddie rides and other attractions. The old woman's shoe... Peter's pumpkin shell, Cinderella's coach, Mother Hubbard's cupboard, the witch's hut. Uh Uh-oh, I said. It's stamped reference only. So? So that means you can't check it out. Who said anything about checking it out? We can make a photocopy. Do you have any money? No, but you must have some. I turned my pockets out to show they were empty. Arthur swore a little swear. Then, taking a quick look around, he stuffed the map into his pocket. Arthur! Shh! We need this more than anybody else I can think of. With that, he headed for the door, pausing on his way out to wave to Mrs. Bailey in the children's room. We'll bring it back, he whispered to me, after Violet figures out where her mother hid the briefcase. First trespassing, now stealing. No, not stealing. Informally borrowing. What would Arthur think of next? 
Although I was positive an alarm would go off, no one stopped us from sauntering out into the steaming July heat. Where to now? I asked wearily. Walmart, he said. Where else? Grabbing our bikes, we sped away unnoticed, uncaught criminals in the making. We might as well have been part of the Jarman Phelps extended family. Chapter 12. At Walmart, we found Violet at her usual station and office supplies, trying to look busy tidying the displays. We brought you a map of the magic forest. Arthur held out the wrinkled sheet of paper. You better keep it for now. Violet's eyes filled with tears. Silas took the note, she whispered. I stared at her too shocked to speak, but Arthur made up for my silence. What do you mean Silas took the note? How did he get it? Violet straightened a row of notebooks. He came over last night, her face colored. I wasn't expecting him. He barged right in demanding to see Danny, and he saw me reading the note. He snatched it out of my hand like he thought, well, I don't know what he thought, but when he saw it, it was from Mom, he took it. Where is he now? Arthur looked around as if expecting to see Silas lurking behind a rack of school supplies. He said something about going to the library, Violet said, which struck me as really weird because I've never seen him pick up a book, let alone read one. No, she corrected herself. He used a dictionary once to prop open a window. Arthur looked at me. That reminds me. Grandma wanted me to see if the new Mary Higgins Clark mystery has come in. She's got it on reserve. But we were just there. Why? Arthur shook his head. Come on, Logan. I don't want to see Silas. Arthur towed me toward the door. Let's go. Wait a minute, Violet called after us. Tell your grandmother I'll be coming over tonight with Danny and May. Not for long, just a couple of nights. Yeah, sure. That's a great idea, Arthur said, trying to sound sincere. Maybe Silas will steal a car or do a little breaking and entering or shoot somebody and get sent back to jail. Then you won't have to worry about him. Violet tried to smile again, a little more successfully this time. We can always hope. As soon as we were outside Walmart's big sliding glass doors, I said to Arthur, tell me why we're going to the library twice in one day. We've got the map. What else do we? Arthur cuffed my arm lightly. Think, Logan, think. Why is Silas going to the library? Feeling stupid, I stared at Arthur. To get a map? Arthur nodded. There were at least two more in the folder. We should have taken them all to keep him from getting one. By the time we got to the library, our clothes were soaked through with sweat, and I was beginning to hate my bike helmet. It made my head feel as if I'd stuck it in an oven. Mrs. Bailey looked up and smiled when we passed her desk. Back again so soon? Did you forget something? Arthur nodded and kept going, with me practically stepping on his heels. We squatted down by the file cabinet, yanked open the bottom drawer, and took out the magic forest folder. Here's another map, I said, rooting one out. Arthur grabbed a third one out of the folder and deftly slipped both of them into the deep pockets of his cargo shorts. As I grabbed another one, I heard a familiar voice. I'm looking for stuff about the magic forest. You got any old maps or anything like that? From the floor, I peeked around a bookcase. Silas stood at the adult services desk. Mrs. Jones, the reference librarian, was getting up to show him the filing cabinets. On all fours, Arthur and I crawled to the men's room as fast as we could go. Crowding into the only stall, we locked the door. My heart pounded and Arthur's face was dead white. His fingers trembled when he shot the bolt into place. Did he see us, he asked. I don't think so, but a lot of other people did. I remembered two or three adults scowling at us. One woman had muttered something about kids horsing around in the library. Apparently, I crawled right over her foot in my haste to reach the men's room. We waited in the stall for a few long minutes. After a while, Arthur said, 
Look out the door and see if he's still there. When I hesitated, he gave me a little shove. Go on, Logan, it's boring in here. I left him in the stall and opened the men's room door, just wide enough to look out. The file cabinets were in plain view. Mrs. Jones was going through the contents of the folder we'd left on the floor. That's funny, she said. There should have been several maps in here. Did somebody check them out? Silas asked. No, they're clearly stamped reference only, she said. I saw some boys looking at that folder, a woman said, the very one whose foot I crawled across. They were making a mess of everything in it. Do you know where they went? Silas asked. She pointed at the men's room. They're probably wrecking the plumbing in there or writing dirty words on the walls. Like a dog who just caught a scent of something interesting, Silas looked toward the men's room. I shut the door and ran back into the stall, bolting it with fumbling fingers. He knows we're in here. As I spoke, the men's room door opened. Arthur and I cowered in the stall, sure we were about to be drowned in the toilet or something equally horrible. Instead of Silas, Mrs. Jones said, Arthur, you come out of there right now. Without consulting me, Arthur opened the stall door. We weren't doing anything, he said in his most innocent voice. Honest. Come here, Arthur. Mrs. Jones looked at me. You too. I followed Arthur out of the men's room. Silas watched us go to Mrs. Jones' side. His face was unreadable, but his eyes scared me. If looks could kill, we'd be on our way to the funeral home. That's the boy, the irate woman pointed at me. He was crawling on the floor. He went right over my foot. I have bunions, you know. It was very painful. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know you had bunions. I meant every word. Even though she hadn't planned to, the crabby old lady had probably saved Arthur's and my lives. Unfortunately, Arthur giggled. Bunions is a funny word when you think about it. But at that moment, nothing could have made me laugh. Not with Silas staring at me with those eyes of his. And what do you find so amusing, the woman asked Arthur. Um, nothing, he muttered, choking back laughter. Mrs. Jones took us each by an arm. Marie, I'm so sorry these boys were rude to you, she said. It must be the heat. They're usually nice, well-mannered kids. If I were you, I'd suspend their library privileges. Mrs. Bunyan started to walk away, but turned back to add, I'd also have your maintenance man check the men's room. There's no telling what they might have done in there. Come along, boys, Mrs. Jones said. I have some chores for you in the workroom. Taking us through the staff-only door, he sat us down at a long table and handed us each a stack of blank cards and a rubber stamp. I don't know what's gotten into you, Arthur. Crawling on the floor like a child, annoying people. Mrs. Jones glanced at me as if I were somehow to blame for Arthur's unusual behavior. But I might as well get some use out of you and your new friend. Stamp due dates on these cards and all will be forgiven. She winked at Arthur as she spoke. Just between us, Marie Pirtle is a pain in the neck, but her husband's on the library board. With that, Mrs. Jones returned to the reference desk. Before she closed the door, I saw Silas slumped in a chair, facing us. Although he had a magazine in his lap, he wasn't reading. He was waiting for us to come out. What do we do now? I asked Arthur. Arthur raised his head. He'd already managed to smear ink all over his fingers and chin. He also stamped 9309 on his arm like a tattoo. That's the date school starts, he said. It's a good way to remember, don't you think? If we're still alive by then. I grabbed the stamp before he could put a date on my arm. How can you goof around at a time like this? Didn't you see Silas sitting in that chair by the door? He'll wait there all day for us. Arthur shrugged. Let him. Are you nuts? I could feel the adrenaline racing through my veins, preparing me for danger, flight, self-defense, whatever it took to save my life. The library closes at six. What happens then? Ignoring me, Arthur got to his feet and walked calmly toward the back of the workroom. He might have been on his way to church or out for an evening stroll. 
Where are you going? He didn't answer, so I followed him. He was standing by a pair of double metal doors painted industrial gray. This is the delivery entrance, he said. Coming? Looking both ways, we darted across the loading dock. Behind us, the door swung shut and locked with a click. We were at the end of an alley. Around the corner, I could see our bikes in the library rack. With my adrenaline at an all-time high, I ran after Arthur, resting my bike free, and flung myself into the saddle. Pedaling with all our might, we zoomed past the Rite Aid drugstore just as Nina stepped off the curb. Trying to avoid her, I lost control of my bike and plowed into Arthur. We both hit the road with a clash of metal. Nina stared down at us, clutching a plastic bag from the drugstore. Are you all right? The two of us scrambled to our feet, desperately trying to untangle ourselves from our bikes. Your knee's bleeding. Nina took my arm. Come into the drugstore. The pharmacist will wash that out and bandage it. No, I pulled away. It's just a scrape. My mom will take care of it. But Logan, she began, we have to go. Despite my injury, I jumped on my bike and sped away, just behind Arthur. I hated to be rude to Nina, but not far off, I could hear a motorcycle revving up. It's Silas, yelled Arthur. Dead ahead was the cemetery, its fancy iron gates open and welcoming. Arthur pedaled straight toward them as fast as he could go, and I raced after him.